Okay, well, welcome to this lecture, The Silk Roads in Myth and History with Dr. Sam Bowker. My name is Natalie Fisher and I'm coming to you from the Wagga Wagga Art Gallery. The traditional owners of the land that I monitor the Wiradjuri people and I'd like to pay my respects to them. This lecture is one in a series of three lectures as part of a Silk in Roads community project that I'm running here in Wagga Wagga in the uh, gallery here. And it's about exploring the visual heritage of the ancient uh, Silk Road through Needlepoint. And what I'm doing is working with more than 70 members of the local community and together we're stitching a body of work for exhibition here in the Wagga Wagga Art Gallery. And um, I'll give you more oh, details so that's the guilt involved. about that later. The project's being funded by the state government uh, in New South Wales through Create New South Wales. And there are other project partners that I'd like to acknowledge as well, including the Wagga Wagga Art Gallery, the Wagga Wagga Council and Library, Eastern Riverina Arts, and the Multicultural Council of Wagga. This series of lectures provides us with an understanding of what we're stitching as a community group. It provides a bit of visual and historical context to what we're doing. And an ideal person to, to do that is Dr. Sam Bowker, who's here with us today. I'm really, really thrilled that he's here to be able to deliver these lectures for you. But before I introduce you and hand over to Sam, I'd like to let you know that this lecture is being recorded and a link will be made available in the coming days if you'd like to see it again or share the link with people people who aren't here with us now. If you have questions for Sam as he's presenting, please put them in the chat box and Sam will leave enough time to walk, work through those at the end of the session and hopefully get to most of your questions or comments. Dr. Sam Bowker is a lecturer, senior lecturer in art history and visual culture at Charles Sturt University here in Wagga Wagga. He's currently sub-dean in graduate studies for the Faculty of Arts and Education. Sam teaches Islamic art and design from contemporary Australian perspectives. He's a curator of numerous exhibitions and an author of many articles and books on diverse aspects of Islamic and Australian art. Sam's PhD was from the Australian National University in Canberra, where he lectured in art and design theory. Sam's currently sitting in his office at the university, a few kilometres up the road from where I am. So I'm now going to say welcome, Sam, and over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Natalie. I'm about to share my screen, so we'll settle in now. I can no longer see uh, the audience joining us today from around the world. So thank you everyone for tuning in today and by the recording. And I also want to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking to you from Wagga Wagga, which is the land of the Wiradjuri people. For the benefit of those joining us, you may periodically hear a little ding ding noise or similar. Don't worry, that's just people joining our conversation today as we speak about the Silk Road in myth and history. So Natalie, just nod you can see the screen correctly. Perfect. In that case, we'll proceed from there. This, of course, is the first of three lectures designed as part of Silk In Roads, a project supported by Create New South Wales and other agencies, including the Wagga Wagga Library, um, the Riverina Regional Library, and the Multicultural Council of Wagga, support the exhibition of translations between ceramic architectural facades, like the one we see here from Afghanistan, into Needlepoint. As far as I'm concerned, this is a world first project. Community engage with the art of Central Asia through another art that is labor intensive, skilled and beautiful, where we learn it from each other. So three lectures. Today we are speaking with an overview of the Silk Road myth and history. In our next lecture, we focus on four sites of significance to our Silk Inroads project. The splendor of the Shah Izinda is where we finish today's lecture, but we'll also speak to the Taj Mahal, the Mazar al Sharif site, and the Jamna Mosque in Yazd, Iran, amongst other sites. And then finally, we'll be speaking to creative translation in art and architecture on cultural appropriation, the respectful study of other crafts, and the meaning of historical heritage craft in contemporary arts. So, for those who have not been joining in the hands-on sewing element of this project, Silk Inroads looks rather like this. 
we are all working to create panels in cross stitch inspired by sections of ceramic facades from Central Asian architecture, including myself. I'm only a quarter of the way through mine on this little video up here, but you can see at least I'm having a go, like the runner at the end of the marathon. But many of us have been creating wonderful embroidery pieces responding to these sites. So let's have a careful look now at what we mean say silk robes and why is it plural for one thing. At the beginning of the project before anyone even had a needle in their hands, Natalie uh, surveyed us with this questionnaire where amongst other things we were asked, how would we describe our knowledge of the materials? You will see that most of us knew nothing or a little, a couple of us knew quite a bit and only one of us filled in the form to say a lot. And I think that might've been me. So we are now proceeding with, this, with a quick checklist, just to give you a sense of what maybe your knowledge of the Silk Road is. Uh, quick checklist, dromedary versus Bactrian, what are we talking about? Camels. Did Marco Polo meet Genghis Khan? What is the Belt and Road Initiative? Are you familiar with Dan Juan or the Sogdians? Do the Ilkhanids ring a bell? And what about the Uyghur people? So as we are looking at these names and ideas and questions, we'll answer and refer to a few of these in the lecture itself. But this is just for you to privately assess your knowledge of the Silk Roads. But I think we all have some knowledge of the Silk Roads. I think it is something that occupies a special space in our imaginations, if not our lived experience, as a concept used to describe not just a part of the world, but our relationships to it, through trade, through exchange, through cultural and linguistic dynamism, which includes Wagga Wagga as a city of communities from around the world. This poem by John Macefield from 1903, Cargoes, for me epitomizes our imagining of the Silk Road, which doesn't tie in specifically to geography, but rather a nostalgia for the past and a sense of history that is biased towards the beautiful, elite and the ornate. So let's take us through this poem. Crinquerim of Nineveh from distant Orphea, rowing home to haven in sunny Palestine, with a cargo of ivory and apes and peacocks, sandalwood, cedarwood, and sweet white wine. Stately Spanish galleon coming from the isthmus, dipping through the tropics by the palm green shores with a cargo of diamonds, emeralds, amethysts, topaz and cinnamon and gold moidores. Dirty British coaster with a salt cake smokestack butting through the channel on the mad March days, with a cargo of thyme coal, road rails, pig lead, firewood, ironware and cheap tin trays. Through these three stanzas, we see an almost biblical history, thousands of years in the past, a more recent history, only 500 to 1,000 years ago, and something approaching modernity. What you are also seeing is in that last stanza, these dirtiness of industrial goods being used for any given person, whereas the others were elite luxuries traded into a mythological level of special, potent, powerful objects for the elite few, symbolic goods, not just the humdrum of the everyday. When I think of the Silk Road, I think it's fair to say we imagine a bias towards those older mythological traded items, more like we imagine the Silk Road on Instagram today. When we are looking at sites like the Shah Izinda, the tomb of the living king in Uzbekistan near Samarkand, what we are looking at here is of course a mausoleum for an individual who crafted it in their or someone else's honor hundreds of years ago, but restored by the Russians after 1989 for the benefit of Instagrammers today. We see in the Silk Road a convolution of what was intended versus what is known, and thus an interpretation between these two, which is poetry, beginning with the word itself, the Silk Road. Silk Roads is a concept which was attributed to a, cart a German cartographer by the name of Ferdinand von Richthofen, who named Silk Road Seedens as a way of describing or solving a problem on a map of multiple Eurasian trade networks. 
The Silk Road, after all, is not one road. It is a series of different movements across geography, from hand to hand, from manufacturing cities, of a culture of import and export. But remembering that when Ferdinand von Richthofen came up with this term, the Silk Roads, Siedenstrasse, he was thinking about it in juxtaposition to another German word, Eisenbahn, the Iron Road. The Iron Road is a railway, which in the 19th century, of course, was proliferating across the world as a marker of both uh, the Industrial Revolution and to some extent cultural imperialism. So the Silk Road was a marker of an unimperial past, a distant and exotic other, an orientalist conception of a place which was home for many millions of people. So when we consider the Silk Roads in this construct, oh, one moment, there we go, pardon me. We just had a glitch on the slides. I'll go backwards by one, there we are. The Catalan Atlas, which you saw a detail of a moment ago with the Bactrian panels, two Humps and Bactrian, one Humble Dromedary, the Catalan Atlas here is an attempt to visualize the known world as far as the trade routes were concerned across the Silk Road spanning Eurasia. You will note that on these maps, Europe is a periphery far off to the far west with China, of course, at the far east and everything else happening in between. When we are thinking about the relationship of center and periphery, we are seeing how histories are told. If we think about the position of Wagga Wagga, for example, halfway between Sydney and Melbourne on the M31, we see the M31 itself situated as a Silk Road, a point between destinations. What I want this lecture to do, however, is focus on not the points in between as of temporary significance, but the points in between the primary significance. And of course, we don't want to locate the Silk Road only in the the idea of the Silk Road as a short poetic phrase to describe a very large number of things is still part of modernity today. And here we are seeing one of the artworks that travels the Silk Road to this day, Pakistani decorated tracks that move across Central Asia into and other areas therein. You will remember here that the Silk Road was not normally traversed in its entirety by any one individual. Instead, an object could travel across the entire Silk Road, but it would be traded hand to hand by individuals who only ever traveled a short section of it in their lifetimes. And here we can see perhaps a more modern take on the Silk Road, identified not through political borders, but the terrain and the cities, which were markers and safe uh, havens for individuals who moved along it. Like we saw in John Maestro's poem earlier, we may imagine this is a trading route for silks and luxury goods like jade, metalwork, ceramics. But of course, it also traveled weapons, slavery, prostitution, and plagues moved along the Silk Road with great ease, just as these beautiful goods that we might choose to remember instead. What we are looking at, of course, is a network of city-states which have rising and falling success over time. These are cities that evolve and change over time. And at certain points in history, were some of the largest cities in the world, like Xi'an, Danghuang, Samarkand, and Damascus, ancient cities of mobility, trade, and prestige. And of course, the melting pot caused by trade is to do with linguistic and cultural exchange. We see the objects of the Silk Road in museums, but we don't necessarily see the ideas that traveled with them. Instead, by locating who owned what and when, and better yet, why it was moved from point to point, we start to unpack histories that are more rewarding because we start seeing the decisions that were being made that gave favor to one idea over another. What we are seeing here is the interactions in a caravanserai a merchant stopping station where goods were stored, but primarily people bartered and exchanged and traded uh, between the incoming and outgoing shipments in the city of Damascus. You will also see the fountain in the center of this room, a particularly important element because trade in medieval Damascus was characterized by the provision of free water in the streets to anyone who came to the city. And of course, in the context of long scale travel through deserts and other arduous terrain, when we are looking at the idea of free water, we see a sustainable basis for ongoing trade. 
and the city uh, caravanserai you saw there, the Ahmed Pasha, uh, Assad Pasha caravanserai, is still very much in existence today. It is in fact a contemporary art gallery amongst other things with these wonderful striking black and white walls and this ocular skylight open to the ceiling. Spectacular sites. And of course, the Silk Road, we tend to gravitate towards the spectacular, not necessarily the the vernacular here I show you in the edges of Iran, which of course is inclusive along the Silk Road, all the way through onto Constantinople, even up to Portugal indeed, across North Africa and Europe, as just as far as it goes towards Japan and Southeast Asia. But cities like Kanarak are more typical, the kind of stopping points the merchants and traders and travelers on the Silk Road would encounter as they moved from point to point. And of course, some of these are places highly evocative to the imagination. The imagination is a kind of vicarious armchair travel, whereas the archaeologist travels to these sites to learn directly from their conditions on the ground. What we in Silk Inroads are doing is harnessing a bit of both. We are looking towards what archaeologists have learned and able to share about these sites, but we study them vicariously from the distance, the safety and comforts of our homes during this great pandemic. What we are seeing here is the Crescent Lake of Danhuang in the Gobi Desert in China. And I share it with you as one of these almost fairy tale real places that do actually exist, providing um, safe haven for travelers, but also a sense of location for the imagination. There are translated names in the Gobi Desert, which are also evocative of the more dangerous aspects of long distance travel. Indeed, one of the regions in the Gobi Desert has a name that translates as the place that no one leaves. So they are definitely working with a diversity of experiences here. And of course, Silk Road, as opposed to Iron Rail. When we are looking at sericulture, the domestication and farming of silk, we are seeing only one particularly famous of the many, many important crafts that characterize this trading network. From the formation of foods and dance and music cultures that also traveled along these roads, and are preserved to this day in cultural heritage, statuary, and other written sources. But sericulture, the silkworm, some people might be surprised to learn that the silkworm is not really a worm, but rather a caterpillar. Indeed, most insects produce silk. I have a, a friend and colleague whose PhD was studying earwig silk, which you wouldn't expect as a form of silk to actually wear, but it has interesting biochemical and physical properties. Indeed, cockroach silk is also a thing, just not a domesticated thing like that of the silkworm Bombyx mori. There are a variety of wild silkworms in use, uh, that is in nature, but approximately 40 decades, over thousands of years since the Neolithic period. And the stories by which silk became monopolized and produced under certain conditions, then traded or more accurately smuggled from one point to another as a highly prestigious luxury product are definitely very inventive adventures in art history. When we are also considering the role of the silk uh, production industries, we can see interesting cultural caveats given to silk as well. Silk was found in tied into the hair of ancient Egyptian mummies very much prior to domestication of silk as a commercial product. We also find that in Islam, there are hadith that prohibit the wearing of silk directly upon the body for men in particular. But these are taken with different uh, degrees of contestation, including the idea that silk can be worn if it's not directly touching one's skin. So silk is a complex story of people making allowances and inventions and trading it very differently over time. We also can see that silk, along with, of course, honey, are the products of only two domesticated insects on a large scale for humans. What we are seeing here is also acknowledgement that the process of creating silk necessitates the killing of the silkworm at larval stage. There are actually forms of what is called ethical silk, known as ahimsa in India, where they collect the silk after the silkworm has emerged from the pupa, which is what you're seeing here and gathered on the floor. And these ahimsa are a rougher, coarser form of silk, not really as shiny and lustrous as what we're working with in our embroidery projects now. And of course, when we consider the movement of silk cultures, we see 
a immediate view of history that omits the vernacular and prioritizes the elite. Because silk, after all, was a valuable trading product, extremely labor intensive, but lustrous to the touch, gorgeous to the eye, and a very sensual element of trade as well. It is seen as a final product of privilege, which is an element that lends it to being preserved in museums, even though the object itself is quite fragile and used in quite specific conditions. So here we see the Japanese silk crafts and traditions, which took different formations as they moved around the world, including into Byzantium, Italy, and other areas uh, of Africa as well. So let's hone in on some of these textile arts of the Silk Road. Oops, that moved by itself, we'll go backwards again. The Rashti Dersi chain stitch embroidery of the Persianate cultures. Here, remark upon the work of anonymous women who characterized the labor of the Silk Road productions, where we remember men who traveled great distances in the Silk Road, who we'll talk about again in a moment because that's convention, but we don't see the extraordinary work of women over time acknowledged for what it was which included, of course, things like this extraordinary tent created for Muhammad Shah of Persia um, during the Qajar period. What we are looking at here is a rare example surviving today in the Cleveland Museum of Art, but we are more likely to encounter on the pages of miniatures, that is to say, manuscript illuminations, which were sustained for individual viewing by those fortunate enough and literate to read them. Here, these extraordinary tents are stylized on the written page, but presented in full. They are shining, exquisite, and mobile architecture, essential to travel along the Silk Road and the statement of prestige and power as one traveled. Of course, we'd be remiss to talk about Central Asian uh, textile heritage and not mention Suzani. Suzani is another form of chain stitch embroidery, which results in very different patterns and colors over the many regions in which Suzanis are produced across Central Asia. The Central Asian states like Kyrgyzstan, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, um, Armenistan, and so on, these create different forms and regions, which are also stylistic to individual families, where they are created again as women's work, but traded by men in marketplaces. What we are seeing here is characteristic of the Suzani format, which includes large areas of negative space, which are then filled with foliate forms, including flowers with very specific names and native to the regions in which they are created. And ikat are perhaps some of the most vibrant and spectacular of the Central Asian crafts, traded along the Silk Road, but also characteristically associated with Central Asia as a region, a region that produces its own culture, language, and heritage, as opposed to simply transmitting other peoples through that region. Remember, the Silk Road is not about simply transmission, it's about many different regions exchanging ideas over time. And these ikat, we should note that you create ikat by dyeing silks first, then weaving them into position. The idea here of the creation of not a printed fabric or an embroidered fabric, but a fabric which is created in certain pure colors, then woven together to create these extraordinary forms. The vibrant ikats are both uh, male and female, they are associated with production by women particularly, but worn by all, especially the elite and wealthy enough to afford these in typical life. Now, moving back into history, if we are thinking about the precursors of trade on the Silk Road, one of the most important cultural groups to acknowledge are the Sogdians. The Sogdians were known to us for a number of long-term impacts beyond city-states where they worked as both nomads and sedentary producers of crafts and other objects, where they worked here with woven silks. Here we see confronted ducks in a pearl roundel. Now that may sound like something of an auction catalog, but truly let's take this stuff out a little bit. A confronted duck is not when you tell it to go away. It is when they face each other. That's called confronted. If their backs are to each other, that's an endorsed duck. So a little bit of heraldry here for you at the moment. Confronted, endorsed. But you'll also see that pearl roundel surrounding them. That is a very typical Sogdian format, but it also appears later in the Byzantine period when the Byzantines independently created silk workshops of their own, but copied Sogdian silks when they wove them from scratch. Likewise, the Mamluks in Cairo, um, hundreds of years later, create roundels which resemble and evoke 
um, linkages to the Sogdian silk patterns and precedents. We also see here the camel with musicians gathered together and traveling across the deserts and traveling across the roads that existed in this region at the time. There's also a very famous uh, precedent in Chinese uh, visual cultures in particular, which is the drunken Sogdian merchant, who is a stylistic trope in Chinese theater as much as Chinese statuary and literature. The Sogdians also gave rise to the Uyghur people as we know them today. What we are seeing here are examples of Sogdian frescoes and murals from the cities that they also created, the temples, the homes, the palaces that once characterized the wealth of their trade pursuits and sustained the markets for diverse patronage, which we see later on in the great court of the Timurids and Ilkhanids amongst others, and Ottomans and Persians. What we are seeing here is also evocative not only of their history, but their mythology this four-armed demon god, which might, or more accurately, which might be presented as a character in a large, larger epic story. This, after all, the Silk Roads, is the region that the Ramayana traveled, a Hindu and Sanskrit story that gave new shapes and forms as it moved from one city to another. And this idea of moving from one city to another, History can be given, I guess, a special stage spotlight on individuals, but it need not be thought of that way all the time. Here we have perhaps three individuals who are particularly well known to us from their travels on the Silk Road, but each came from a very different perspective. The Chinese monk Zhang Zhang traveled from Xi'an in China, known as Chang, uh, to verify the original sources of Buddhist texts that he was studying. He wanted to resolve contradictions that he was encountering in those texts. And his 16 to 18 year quest to India was performed with the authorization of his uh, reigning monarch in Xi'an. So he traveled illegally and found himself facing all kinds of adventures, having to prove his mastery of different languages and skills and religious uh, principles as he traveled, eventually returning to Xi'an, having uh, conducted primary research in India regarding the origins of Buddhism, which of course is an essential element of movement along the Silk Road, history and cultures to this day. What we are seeing though is not just the travels of Zhang Yang, but of Miss Ibn Battuta, who was a great advocate of travel, noting the Rifa genre of travel writing in Arabic, which uh, has a lot to do with, of course, the travels of Ibn Battuta over a 26 year period. We may, however, be more familiar with the work of Marco Polo, the Venetian merchant who traveled to uh, along the Silk Roads, meeting up with Kublai Khan, who was the grandson of Genghis Khan. So as we are looking at these travelers' accounts of the diversity of cultures and sites seen along the Silk Road, we may look upon them with some degree of skepticism, or at least we should, because we're combining travel writing with a sense of worldview, which was both accessible and inaccessible. Accessible to them, inaccessible to us, inaccessible to them, accessible to us. We end up with a different viewpoint of what their accounts say when we start collaborating it against other accounts um, from individuals who weren't necessarily traveling long distances like these people were, but rather resident more locally to where these people visited. And I think of all of those manuscript sources, the travelers' accounts end up in particular cities and they're distributed by print. The manuscript accounts, again, are quite different. Manuscripts, after all, are essentially predating the printed form. They are texts which are archived and kept often as singular documents, codices and indexed in very particular ways as individual objects. The library cave of Dan Huang is an extraordinary world heritage site, which preserves the works of many different languages and religions, including the Manichurians, Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians, Hindi uh, religion, Hindu religion, pardon me, and Muslim texts. What we are seeing here is Paul Pella, who is sorting through those manuscripts with an exposed candle flame, something you probably wouldn't do these days. And of course, Wang Yanlu, who opened the library cave for um, survey and scholarship elsewhere. Interestingly, the texts of the Huang Yang uh, library cave were largely divided and taken from different collections in Europe and elsewhere by British and French archeologists and manuscripts um, scholars 
who variously took them because they seemed interesting or took them because they could actually read the text and thus chose texts which they knew to be interesting uh, for future scholarship. Right now, to this day, the Dan Huang manuscripts are being digitized and placed online for all to access. But I haven't mentioned that beautiful yellow peony in the corner, that flower. Textiles were discovered amongst that manuscript library. They were rolled up, folded. They were the objects that the manuscripts were tucked within. Textiles that were embroidered, dyed, and otherwise created to be beautiful carrying vessels. So what we are seeing here is the importance of textiles at almost every stage of Silk Road production. What we are seeing here is also one of the world's earliest printed books known to survive to the present day. The Diamond Sutra of Buddhism, here we're seeing the opening page, now in the British Library, from the cave library at Dan Huang. So quite an extraordinary thing to have survived this far, but even more extraordinary still, the text of the Diamond Sutra states that these pages are free for anyone to reproduce. They were open source knowledge and learning resources right from the day they were created in the seventh century. And of course, if we are thinking about the production and proliferation of different material cultures evocative of religion, it's important here to note the interactions between different religions. What we are seeing here is the Bodhisattva, so uh, enlightened follower of Buddha, of Avalokiteshiva. And as we are looking at this individual, we may know them better as Guan Yin, a household goddess of mercy, seen throughout many uh, families of Chinese heritage today. Indeed, in my family as well, which we used to live in Malaysia when I was very, very young, we have a household Guan Yin as well. But when we are looking at this particular uh, statue, we are seeing a piece by the Sui dynasty, which was a very short-lived dynasty, about 40 or so years, if I recall correctly, which preceded the Tang dynasty. And the Tang dynasty was seen as especially powerful on the Silk Road, benefiting and extrapolating power by trade networks across Central Asia. And here we have an extraordinary object with a storied history of 2020. This, of course, is a um, Quran, the interpreted as the divine word of God, as narrated through the Prophet Muhammad for Muslims. What we are seeing here is one of the most unusual Quran in that it is produced on Chinese paper, hand illuminated, not unusual in itself, but with extraordinary uh, text accompaniment of these landscape scenes, these foliate forms, patterns and references we don't find in many other places in Korans around the world. This is a Central Asian Koran characteristic of trade on the Silk Road, amongst other things. But interestingly, it came to auction in 2020 with what's described as a no provenance provenance. It was purchased by the owner's father in the 1980s, no other details provided. The controversy is not only this is a no provenance, we don't know where it was for the intervening years, but it may have been looted from a Uyghur family in Western China. So the controversy now is what was the history of this object that turned up beautiful in the hands of private collectors and is now available in its entirety on Wikipedia, scanned one page at a time for all of us to study. Now, as we continue to look at what these objects tell us about their own past, the importance of trade of ceramics and textiles were particularly useful to us because glass on the Silk Road wasn't really traded as an object per se. Instead, glass makers were traded along the Silk Road. Glass moved from city to city, and accordingly, the cities produced glass, but it rarely traded long distances over land. Instead, maritime trade was more popular with glass movement. What we are seeing here, of course, are these beautiful blue and white ceramics, which over many centuries were produced and traded between Silk Road cities. And here we are seeing the Ilkhanid mode, which is a later dynasty created after the expansion of the Mongol empires across Central Asia. Here indeed we see a Mongol tent, uh, technically a mosque tent. So it's a mosque in the form of a tent whose calligraphy suggests its purpose to us over the doorway there. And what we are seeing, of course, is that unified blue and white between the two. One of the most popular questions we've had on the Silk Inroads project is why are these tiles blue and white and green, amongst other things? 
So I thought we'd take a little pause here on ceramics in color to focus on the Silk Road colors. What we are looking at here, of course, is a complex heritage of many different ways to arrive at the color blue. But one of the most popular of these was the use of mined cobalt from the mountains that characterize um, the Himalaya and areas like this. So cobalt, also smalt, which was a chemical byproduct involving a glass product, and what was called azure in medieval texts could describe a variety of different chemical processes, including the use of cobaltite or cobic, cobalt arsenic sulfate. Doesn't sound delicious, but when we are looking at these colors, they were used to create different glazes over time, as well as pigments that were used in quite different contexts. Though perhaps you've already heard of one of the most famous blues of the Silk Road, lapis lazuli. Now, lapis lazuli, also known as ultramarine, because literally ultramarine over the ocean, ultramarine past the oceans, was a long distance traded object of extreme value, more valuable than gold for much of its history. And what we are seeing here are two unusual objects. This view of the Porta Livorno is a tabletop assembled from pieces of stone sliced into thin sections and presented as literally the sea of lapis lazuli. We are also seeing a piece, oh, sorry, that little yellow circle should be a little bit lower, but that's okay. You might be able to see a little bit of blue behind that person's teeth of all things to be seen. Those teeth belong to a medieval woman who was buried near a monastery. How did she end up with a lapis lazuli in her gums? This was a burial performed at a time before people were prescribing lapis lazuli for any medicinal purpose that we know of today. Instead, it is thought that she was a painter of illuminated manuscripts, and there are tiny pieces of lapis lazuli caught in the enamel between her teeth. It is suspected that she was a painter who took the paintbrush and periodically placed it between her teeth to straighten it again, to achieve a point like we might like to do when threading a needle and then going back to sewing again or painting in this case. So we find lapis lazuli in the strangest of places, knowing it is traded from only one small set of mountains in what is now Afghanistan. Lapis lazuli being so expensive was reserved for the painting of the robes of the Virgin Mary. If there was a more expensive pigment, we'd probably see the Virgin Mary wearing that instead. But we also see it here presented as an object of its own interest, part of the idea of the cabinet of curiosities, this uniquely blue hard stone traded from across extraordinary distances. Now, as we think about the benefits of trade and the idea of prestige, we must also remember that the Silk Road was a pathway for armies as much as it was for traders and that raiders on the Silk Road were one of the reasons why caravanserai and indeed cities existed because they were safe places to perform exchanges. The Mongol conquest transformed Central Asia. Indeed, it transformed the world's population. It was tremendously disruptive for city production, but also gave rise to new periods of movement between artisans. The Mongol conquest disrupted state and political boundaries and borders, and gave artisans new reasons to live in different places, both refugees and literally moved by patrons to new homes. So what we are seeing in this case was a period of over 150 years across Central Asia, where Genghis Khan began in many ways by sacking the cities of Bukhara, Samarkand, Baghdad, and others, uh, but which also saw the restoration of many of these cities over time in a Mongol style which became variously the Yuan Dynasty in China, the Ilkhanids towards Persia, and later on Timur and the Timurid Dynasty that followed the Ilkhanids. What we are seeing here, I think, is quite an evocative object, a safe conduct pass, a little check in the era before passports to show that you had permission to travel in a particular way. From hand to hand, these would be exchanged as ambassadors on the Silk Road. But you'll notice also the Fakbar script was actually named after one particular individual, not the one who translated it, like, say, Champollion with the hieroglyphics, but rather Fakbar designed the script. They were a Tibetan monk whose task was to create a written language for a previously oral language. The Mongols did not have a written script until Fakbar generated this for the administration 
of Genghis Khan's conquest of land. So this brings us now from the Ilkhanids towards the Timurids. The Ilkhanids were, of course, I showed you earlier, an Ilkhanid pot and tent. What we are seeing now is architecture of the Timurid period. In fact, the Registan we see here is a kind of public square between three madrasa or schools. The early one being the back, uh, created in the first part of the 15th century, the later two towards the 17th century, under the auspices of Timur, known to many in Europe as Tamerlane. Tamerlane was of particular world historical importance. What we are seeing here is the horoscope of Tamerlane produced using Persian understandings of astrology, remembering that astronomy is what the night sky is doing, what the stars are doing, but astrology is what the stars are doing to you. This was a map created of the night sky on the day that Timur was born, trying to understand what characteristics gave him the ability to be a major world leader just in case it ever happened again. And of course, the patterns evoke different mythological contexts. The constellation Scorpio here, for example, along with other constellations that are not necessarily familiar to our zodiac, but rather perform part of Central Asian mythologies. Central Asian mythologies are rife through poetry, literature, dance, and performance cultures. And here we see one of the great Persian poems by um, Farid al-Din Attar, the Conference of the Birds. The Conference of the Birds is a gathering of 30 different birds led by the hoopoo, the little one with the crest there in the middle. And the hoopoo wants them to find Simur, the king of the birds. Only at the end of the journey do they realize that Simur is also Persian for 30 birds. They were their own king all along. And we see here an image of a phoenix, which is in many ways similar to the actual Simur, which looks like this. Simorg is said as a giant bird, often with a dog-like face, who carries uh, white uh, animals in his claws as it takes him away to mountains to be eaten. Simorg is seen more like a dragon, an entity that lives for thousands of years, rather than a species of creature like a phoenix. It's more of an individual creature rather than a species. But you'll also notice that these are fine tile work, each tile being created to a separate size and shape, fitted together more like a mosaic than a single composition as such. This pattern of using ceramic architecture facades is consistent across many parts of the Silk Road, moving towards West Asia in particular. Here we are looking at 19th century facades from Golestan Palace in the Qajar era in Tehran in Iran, where we are seeing elements which are both visually stylized as evocative of the geometric patterns we might see in North Africa, but also the curvilinear forms typical to Europe, remembering that this was a place of innovation through exchange. Ideas come together and are fused visually to create forms which are distinctive to the places that commissioned them. And you can see here some of the value of ceramic facades in the cityscapes of the Central Asian cities. Remembering that these were cities defined by architecture of mud, brick, and stone, and coated in the dust of the deserts, much like many North African cities today. Ceramics stood out as shining and vibrant, and also protected the structure to some extent. They were a bit like wrapping an Easter egg in foil, a colorful exterior to a more durable interior. And here we see the Yazd um, uh, Mosque, the Congregational Mosque, which we will revisit in future lectures with the towering minarets high over the city as a whole, and the Liwan at the entranceway acting as an archway and gate into the mosque complex itself. You can see how these sites captured the imagination of artists for generations. Here we are seeing an example of Russian Orientalism. Russian Orientalism looked to Central Asia rather than the Middle East, whereas British and French Orientalism looked towards North Africa and the Middle East, as a legacy of colonial endeavors in these regions. What we are seeing here is a site which may be taken perhaps as a collection of merchants and traders. It is in fact a collection of local warlords and leaders who are gathering. They are triumphant because if you look extremely carefully at those long white poles, they're carrying severed heads upon them. A gruesome reminder of what the realities of some of the politics were in this place, but also interesting because Vasily Verashkin is focusing on this idea of barbarism or trauma as a way of telling a story. 
He's giving us a beautiful building, but he's situating it against something that juxtaposes it. What we are trying to do in Silk Roads is to look more carefully at the building itself and the motifs that those artisans had in mind when they created these extraordinary sites. The Russians were also responsible for significant change along the Silk Road through their heritage sites. Under the Soviets, uh, these sites were somewhat neglected except by archaeologists. And then in the post-Soviet period, after about 1989, we started seeing the restoration of heritage sites and ruins to become the sites we see them as today, tying in with national sentiment resurging and the rise of tourism in, in these areas. And that's basically what brings us to our next lecture. We will be looking more closely at these specific sites, the extraordinary Sha'i Zinda, the tomb of the living king, uh, which is a complex of mausolea and shrines presented across um, Uzbekistan. And you'll see here a detail of some of the ceramics that we are looking at very carefully in order to create needlepoint interpretations thereof. Here we can see how these saturate the eye and create otherworldly realities of decadent pattern and color, forms which are imaginative, labor intensive, and highly evocative of the diverse cultures that led to this final product. And on that note, I'll just give you this as a teaser of the kinds of things that Natalie Fisher is working closely on and we'll be working on together as we bring our exhibition together for the Wagga Wagga Regional Art Gallery. So that's what ends this lecture now. I'll hand over to share the screen and we'll look at answering some questions. So how do you feel about your knowledge of the Silk Road now? I hope you know a bit more than you did an hour ago. Thank you for your time. Okay, let's have a look now. Uh, do we have any questions? Can't hear you, Nat. Yep. I, I just received a message from someone to say the chat box has been disabled. So I don't know if that's the same for everyone. So if anyone would like to try the chat box, we can see if that is the situation for everyone. And if, Hi, Julie. If it Hello, is Julie, the case, then we might just unmute people. And you if can you have any questions, them. raise your hand and we'll jump to you if you like to. I will Good start, to see Sam. People around the world. Very nice. Sam, I'd like to start by asking a question, if I may. Of course, um, the, you, You're talking about this. It's, it's a very complex uh, subject matter. It's a huge geographical area that you're covering. And uh, congratulations and thank you for, for disseminating into such a, a, um, a digestible, you know, 45 minutes because we've talked about um, manuscripts and religion and architecture and all sorts of things, even confronted ducks. Fabulous. But um, often this subject is referred to as the Silk Road rather than the Silk Roads plural. Is that just, why is that? Is that just to make things simpler and easier? Ah, uh, yes, it's a reductivist view of history to have a singular Silk Road like the M31 that all fits on a two-way exchange and has potholes. No, the Silk Roads is more accurate plural. And indeed, some people call it the Silk Roads or routes. Um, as multiple pathways, including maritime and on road directly. It's a bit like what we're now seeing with China and the idea of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is both land and sea. So Silk Roads, plural, is more accurate. So that's a good question to start with. Thank you, Natalie. And David, you have your hand raised as well. So I'll hand over to you for a question if you like. Hello, Sam. Thanks very much for a fabulous lecture. And uh, those amazing of museum objects, just fantastic, uh, very inspirational. One of the um, maps that you showed earlier showed, this is one of the maps, showed an outbound route, which get, at least gave me the impression that it was a one-way street. What, if so, a one-way route? And if so, why? Okay, I had some issues with your audio just then at my end. I don't know if that's the same for everyone else, but if I understood you correctly, you asked, uh, one of the maps gave the impression of it being a one-way route, and if so, why? Uh, if that was the case, I'm terribly sorry. They should all be seen as two-way exchanges. If there's anything like a one-way route in uh, the Silk Road's history, it was probably the movement of armies taking one city onto another. That's a very 
But almost all of these imply a movement between one is possible to go back on the same. Indeed, almost every merchant who traveled it would have gone backwards and forwards again, having homes in both places or home in one and travel to the other. So I think it's a, a very important element of map design is what purpose does this map serve? It's never what does the map show us, it's who is trying to learn about that place. So when we see a map, I think it's always important to see them as mutual exchanges. But thank you for that really good question. The idea of a one-way travel map is a controversial thing. It should always be two-way. Thank you, David. And uh, Sarah has your hand raised too. That is uh, Sarah Lilburn. I also see Julie has a hand raised too. So Sarah, if you wish to unmute yourself, I can... Oh, on the video, yeah. Hello, Sarah. Oh, hi, Sam. Um, thank you. That was um, so much information. And I have knowledge from way back when I was helping one of my kids with the Silk Roads, Silk Roads project in school at some point in time. Um, there's so much information. But, and so historically, I understand the, the trade back and forth, but I'm wondering what it looks like now. Are the, are what are there parts that you still go on as it was in whatever century, you know, the seventh, I don't, can't remember quite what date you said, but just wondering what that sort of looks like now and, and how accessible that is. That's a really good question. If you imagine something like the Great Wall of China, you have the parts which are preserved or beyond as they were when they were new, sort of Disney-fied, and then the areas which are deep in the desert and they're only a few eroded bricks high. Uh, it's like that diversity. You have areas of the Silk Road which are absolutely modern highways with fast food stalls nearby, down to much more uh, isolated rural roads, which are occasionally even dirt tracks to this day, or much, much older stones and preserved in different ways. So the Silk Roads, depending on where you are in the world, they can look like anything. And perhaps the best way to see it from the comfort of your uh, own TV screen or you know, computer screen is by exploring Google Earth where you can go on different sites and have a sense of the actual landscape reported yeah. recently. Okay, yes, lovely, possible. thank you. No worries at all. And Rob Ball, I see, oh sorry, Julie, I think you had up earlier. Julie, on the screen, I see you're in your room there. Yep. Yes, hello, thank you very, very much. I'd like to reiterate um, both of those. And Natalie, it's Pat, not Julie. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, not a problem. It says Julie, I'm on Julie's computer so it's oh, it happens um, yep Nat will know who that is um look thank you so much the information was was great but the my main thing was with the china i was so intrigued with the lapis lazuli with that with the um making of it i never ever knew that that was how it was done before but your information was fabulous just like your mother oh Okay. Thank I'm you also biased, much. and Jenny no. is in this room, so hello, Mum. Very nice. I oh, know she it was lovely to know that I finally see you in pleasure. I've heard of you often, so thank you very much, Dan. That's very kind. Thank you. Lapis lazuli is a wonderful traded object, and of course, it remains to be traded around the world to this day now from Afghanistan. Rob, I have a question. Rob, thank you. Thanks, Sam. That, that was a magnificent lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. You, you took us on the thread of time, the historical current of time, which was great. I want to zoom in to the kinds of artworks that the team in Wagga are working on, or the, the images and the ones that Natalie's taken. Are they of a fairly narrow time period, or would the example stretch over a lot of time? They stretch over a lot of time, but they weren't designed to stretch across a survey of time. We're not trying to take, say, a 200-year series of intersections over the Silk Road. Instead, we are looking at four sites in particular, which are both of different periods in history. So we have Taj Mahal, the Mughal, um, stonework and stone inlay work from there. We have the Shah is Zinda sites, which go over a number of centuries. We have the um, Yazd Mosque in, oh, sorry, I mean, Isfahan Mosque, pardon me. Uh, we are looking at different sites elsewhere in Afghanistan too, the Mazar-i-Sharif Blue Mosque. 
Many of these are relatively recent restorations of much older designs. So when Natalie and I were looking at these photographs that Natalie collected, we talked about some of the images which are clearly a more modern restoration and some which are older. And we generally removed the ones we knew were modern restoration. So we tried to show the actual work that we know to be from the period um, that the site was most associated with. So I hope that answers your question. We're trying to do particular types. Okay, thank you very much then. No worries at all. But we'll focus more on those sites in the next lecture coming up uh, when we look at the splendor of the Shah Azinda and other sites. Thank you, Rob. Now, who else has a question? Anyone else? Kathy Johnson in the USA. Good to see you. Okay, Kathy, please. Not a question. Just wanted to say hi, Sam. Great lecture. <laughs> oh, thank you very much indeed. Um, you must be very late over there. So you've done very well to get this early. And I also see that Alexandra uh, has also joined us from Colorado and amongst others. So great to see. Thank you very much. Okay. And two participants have raised their hands, but who are they? Who else has raised um, their hands? Rob. Oh, it must be Kathy and Rob. Fair enough. Good to see you too, Sarah from Cross Harbor. Very nice. Uh, and who else do we have? Anyone else for questions? I think that's about it then, perhaps. About it. Sam, I'd like to thank you once again. And um, it, it's just fabulous to have you bring all this together and provide such important context to the Silk Inroads project here in Wagga Wagga. So um, we look forward to the next one. Thank you very much for, for today. And thank you to everyone for coming along. And we hope to see you on Saturday, the 19th of February for Sam's next lecture. And I will send details around for that and let you know when it is. But um, thanks again, Sam. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Have a lovely Saturday afternoon, everyone. And if you're listening to this on the recordings, I hope you enjoy the next lecture too. See you later. Thanks, Sam. <laughs>